Bibles. Get yours and uh, open it, please, to uh, 1 Peter chapter 4. 1 Peter chapter 4. And while you're turning there, I'm going to put back up on the screen Job 23.10. Do you have that? Job 23.10. Um, he knows the way that I take, and when he has tried me, I shall come forth as gold. We talked about he knows, and we've talked about he knows the way I take. Uh, now how about this? He knows the way I take, and when he has tried me. That's clearly uh, implying, if not outright stating, uh, that trials have a season. But for now, let's just acknowledge that the, the normal nature of trials is that they're for a season. For weeks or months or years, probably not for decades, uh, probably not for your whole life. Some are like that, but the normal trial is for a season. Uh, Hebrews chapter 12 says uh, that uh, uh, no trial seems to be joyful for the moment, but afterwards it, you see, so afterwards it yields the peaceable fruits of righteousness to those who are trained by it. So normally it's for a season. Everyone say it's for a season. All right? And I know there are exceptions, and we're going to those uh, God, by God's grace in the weeks to come. But for now, uh, let's just say together, he knows the way that I take, and when he has tried me, I shall come forth as gold. Say it with that key word emphasized. Let's all say it together. He knows the way that I take, and when he has tried me, I shall come forth as gold. Turning your trials to gold. Now, um, what to do uh, with trials um, 1 Peter chapter 4, a little bit of the uh, context here while we get into it. Let's remember that uh, the word trials is the summary term for this uh, study that we're going through. Uh, but testing is another biblical term. Chastening, as we saw a couple of times ago, is also a key term. Uh, in this uh, passage, in 1 Peter 4, uh, Peter refers to it as suffering. And I just want you, if you'd like to turn in your Bible, just start with me uh, in 1 Peter chapter 1. Let's see if we can pick up the theme of 1 Peter. It won't be hard. Uh, 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 1 says, uh, to the elect uh, exiles. So these are people who had been uh, sent away from their homeland because of their faith in Jesus Christ. Verse 6, though now uh, for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials. And then moving down the page, chapter 1, uh, verse 11 says, he predicted the sufferings of Christ. There's the key word that's going to come up again and again. Uh, chapter 2, verse 11, that you're sojourners and exiles. Chapter 2, verse 19, one endures sorrows while suffering unjustly. Uh, next verse, uh, you do good and suffer for it. Verse 21, Christ also suffered, leaving you an example to follow in his steps. Verse 23, that when he was reviled, he did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten. Chapter 3, likewise, wives, likewise, verse 7, husbands, likewise what? Likewise, when you suffer. That's what he's talking about. That's what the likewise is. That's what the whole theme is. Uh, chapter 3, verse uh, 13. Now, who is there to harm you if you are zealous for what is good? But even if you suffer for righteousness' sake, verse 16, when you are slandered by those who revile, verse 17, better to suffer for doing good, verse 18, Christ also suffered. Okay, anybody got the theme yet? All right, it's kind of hard to miss, isn't it? Uh, look at the passage in front of us here, chapter 4, verse 1. Since therefore Christ suffered, whoever suffered, chapter uh, 4, verse 12, do not be surprised at the fiery trial, verse 13, as you share Christ's sufferings, um, verse 16, if anyone suffers as a Christian, verse 19, let those who suffer according to the will of God, uh, chapter 5, verse 1, of the sufferings of Christ, I'm trying to figure out the theme, it's not coming to me. Chapter 5, verse 10, the, uh, the devil, uh, like a roaring lion seeking someone to uh, devour. And uh, chapter 5, verse 10, and after you have suffered a little while, I'm suffering reading this. Okay? And uh, the theme, I think, is coming out uh, fairly clearly here. Uh, lift up your voice. The key word in this book, 1 Peter, is? All right. So we're not off topic here. I'm not pulling. Everybody agree? I'm not pulling this out of context. I can't believe he thought 1 Peter 4 was about suffering. Yeah, well, it is. Okay? And, and uh, no question about that at all. And uh, so just jot down this first thought. Um, suffering will come. Suffering will come. It's part of the Christian life. And if it's not what you signed up for, if you uh, bought into some sort of, uh, you know, psychological self-help, uh, Jesus will improve my portfolio gospel, uh, well, welcome to the biblical gospel. Okay? 
Uh, this is not your rest. We're just strangers here on earth, okay? This is not our homeland, all right? We, we got, we're, we're seeking the city which is to come, all right? Now, that's not the popular Western world Christianity. I know everything here has to be wrapped up in how my life can be better by Friday, all right? But because it's truth that sets you free, we'll just go ahead and go with what God's word says. In fact, didn't Paul say to Timothy that all who live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer? All will suffer. Just turn to your neighbor and say all. All right? All right, so, yeah, well, who, 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 who exactly does that all include? Are you okay? It includes you. All right? It includes all of us. All of God's children suffer. And uh, so you say, well, what's, what's your point? Well, the way I look at it is, is that warning is loving. I mean, if, if, if you're driving down the freeway and, and all of a sudden somebody cuts in front of you and you see there's a collision coming, you brace yourself. Okay? And, and uh, if I was walking down the aisle here or something like that and you stuck out your foot and I started to fall... First thing I do is what? I put my hands out and I'm gonna fall on my face. I'm gonna break my fall a little bit. And and that's what everyone does. You you brace yourself. You know when 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 a team wins the Super Bowl and all the crazy football players grab the uh, the Gatorade bucket and they sneak up behind the coach. Is it crazy that they don't know that's coming? I was like, dude, you're you're the head coach. How could you be surprised by that? But they always are surprised, and they dump it on them. And what's the first? Everyone make the first physical reaction they make when they feel that cold water. Do it. They, 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 they brace themselves, okay? Now look at, look at, look at. The reason why God's word says over and over and over and over and over and over that the number one tool in God's chest for chiseling our character is trials, suffering, persecution, hardship is so that we can brace ourselves. So that's what we're starting in this study. Suffering will come. It absolutely, categorically will come. You say, well, I thought you were going to tell us what to do. Yeah, three main headings now to take us through the rest of the text. Here's the first one. Guard your behavior. Guard your behavior. Notice chapter 4, verse 1. Since, therefore, Christ suffered in the flesh. There's an irrefutable point. Since, therefore, Christ suffered for our sins, he, he, he died an atoning death as a sacrifice for our sins, and he paid a price, he suffered in the flesh. Since, therefore, Christ suffered in the flesh, arm yourselves, that's a great term, it's a technical military term, it means to get ready for battle, it means put your armor on. Since, therefore, Christ suffered in the flesh, arm yourself with the same way of thinking. How did Jesus, well, you heard him. If you read the Gospels, he was always talking about, you know, my time has not yet come, my time has not yet come. Jesus knew from moment A where this was all going to end up, okay? I just hate that idea that, oh, it got kind of out of control there, and Jesus ended up on the cross. You know, what are we going to do now? Uh, incorrect, all right? And, of course, we understand that Jesus could have called legions of angels, I mean, Jesus was in complete and total control. He went to the cross. The Bible says that he turned and went to Jerusalem. He willed himself and went to the cross. And, and we need to arm ourselves with the same mentality. I'm going to get through this. I'm going to get through this. This is my mindset. This is my focus. I'm not surprised by it. I, I, I'm not like, how come I'm going through hard times? Uh, duh. You're one of God's children. All right? And the Lord chastens them, those he loves. And so arm yourself with the right mentality. Guard your behavior. Notice the end of the verse. For whoever has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin. Now that uh, has actually caused some real um, <laughs> confusion among people. Uh, some people say, well, what that means then is, is that whoever has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin. Well, some people have taken that to mean that uh, uh, Jesus... Uh, sinned until he went to the cross, and then after in his resurrection body, uh, then he was sinless. What do we think of that interpretation? Um, eh, okay, 
Uh, incorrect. The Bible's categoric about Hebrews 4.15 in many places that Jesus uh, uh, knew no sin, that he was without sin. He was tempted in all points like we are, yet without sin. So, yeah, clearly not that. And then uh, some people say, well, what that means is, is that when I'm suffering, uh, it means that when I'm suffering that I won't sin. Okay, let's put that one in the wish it were true category. Okay? A fact of the matter is, though, is, is that often, uh, am I right? Often the opposite is true. Often what happens is, is that when we're going through difficult times, this is when we're most vulnerable to sin. This is when, and I, I like to teach our people that, that you get better or you get bitter. All right? That's how it goes with trials. You get better or you get bitter. This, this, is, this is the reality, and, and we need to embrace it. Uh, either I'm going forward and upward and onward, or I'm going downward and backward and inward. This is the watershed moment. What am I really going to allow God to do in my life during this time? Guard your behavior. It simply means the mindset of a warrior. War will and should and must make me a better soldier. Training is good, but getting through this battle, this is going to make me the person God created me to be. Notice now, just going through the text, whoever has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin. Actually, a, a better translation there in some ways might be, uh, can, it can mean actually the idea of restrained. It can mean restrained. And that captures the tense a little bit better. Whoever has suffered is restrained from sin. God's desiring is that suffering would make you a better man or a better woman. And, and uh, God wants to use this uh, in my life. I, I will say this. Though temptation can sometimes be heightened during trials, there is a sense in which, as I look back through my journal over the last year and over the last few years, I'm going to say a little bit more about that uh, in this session, um, I have to say that there's a seriousness that has come into my spiritual life. If there were some things that I was not proud of that were lingering in the corridors and around the edges of my life, as you begin to formulate in your life some, tr some prayer requests that you have to have, be it for a business or a prodigal or a health concern or whatever, something, I have to have this. One of the immediate things you do is you begin to formulate a list of, okay, God, anything you want to take off my list? Anything I need to deal with, God? Anything I need to get right with you about? Anything I've not been listening about? And, and that's what they're going for here, that the mindset of a warrior is, I'm not going to carry anything extra into this battle. So... Arm yourselves with the same kind of thinking. Whoever has suffered in the flesh has been restrained from sin. Notice, so as to live for the rest of his time in the flesh. I love that, the rest of his time. I love it where the Bible reminds us that life is not going to go on forever. And one of the things that trials do, this is part of guarding your behavior. All right, it's the general heading of this section. One of the things that trials do for us is that they remind us that life is not going to go on forever. Do you, do you understand that? And, and you look good, but you don't look as good as when I met you, okay? <laughs> and I've known you for a decade now, and let me just say that both of us, we're in a free fall, okay? <laughs> and uh, the outward man is perishing. Isn't that right? All right? You only got a few more years. And it doesn't matter. Some of us are going to leave a little early. Some of us are going to leave a little late. But I'm going to guarantee you a thousand years into eternity, we won't be talking about who was here 15 seconds longer. Okay? Life is short. It's short. James says it's a vapor. And the further you get down the road looking over you, the more you got in the rearview mirror, the faster it seems to go. Am I speaking the truth? Let's have an old person tell us that. Pastor, is that right? <laughs> Isn't that right? Isn't that right? The older you get, the faster. Just lift up your hand if you know I'm speaking the truth about that. All right? And that's why he says, look in the text. So as to live the rest of the time, tick tock, tick tock, tick tock. No longer for human passions, God forgive me for the months and the years that I spent with my pleasure at the top of my agenda. What a shallow existence that was. So as to live for the rest of the time in the flesh, 
in the flesh, no longer for human passions, but for the will of God. God has a will, and, and this is a completely separate series. We won't get into this uh, this time, but this will help. God's will is God's word. Next subject, okay? People come up to me frequently, and they say, oh, Pastor James, you know, what's God's will for me? God's will is God's word. But I want to know if God wants me to move to Topeka, Kansas. He doesn't care. All right? Trust me on this. He'll still be able to do what he's doing here even if you're in Kansas. But I just want to know if he'll use me. He'll use you wherever you are if you're obedient to his word. Okay? God's will is for you to keep your commitments. God's will is for you to be a person of integrity. God's will is for you to be a hard worker. God's word is for you to be a person of truth and, and sincerity and, and, and commitment to his. That's God's will. Get all that done, then come back for more instructions, all right? Um, I, I don't know about you, but I just find it hard to do everything in the Bible. Anybody a little overwhelmed by the biblical content? Man, I just hate the idea that there's some extra stuff we got to figure out, okay? Now, this is the will of God. Paul said, your sanctification. God's incredibly interested in the kind of person you are. And if you can be the kind of person God wants you to be where you are, I think is a lot less significant. So back to the text. In the flesh no longer for human passions, but for the will of God. Now if someone hears that and they think to themselves, yeah, I don't know if I'm completely done with human passions. Verse 3. The time that is past suffices for doing what the Gentiles do. It's like, yeah, do you ever notice how when you think back, when you think back, for example, to college, wasn't it great when we were in college? Yeah, I wish you'd taken more careful notes, okay? It was sort of great, but sort of not. Yeah, but I mean, when I was a kid, when I would go to summer camp, yeah, we got the video of that. You weren't that happy, <laughs> Okay? And, and, and I, just, I just hate this idea that somehow over time we forget about the challenges of every season of life and we look back wistfully longing for some previous time. How about right now? How about right here, right now making the most of my time? And worst of all, worst of all is looking back to your BC days, which stands for, and thinking to yourself, yeah, now that I'm kind of done with the sin thing, I... There was a couple of things I left off the list. Are you kidding me? Are you kidding me? Look at the text. The time that is past suffices for doing what the Gentiles do. Um, does anyone have a list of what the Gentiles do? It means, uh, actually, Peter has one. It begins in the next word. Living in sensuality. Uh, the word there is a flagrant, unrestrained sexuality. No boundaries, no shame. That's sensuality. And then uh, passions and uh, orgies. Now that doesn't mean just sexual, though it definitely means that. Multiple partners, multiple times. But it actually, these were feasts, and, and they would stuff themselves with food, and then they would make themselves vomit so they could eat more. And then stuff themselves with food and make themselves vomit and eat and vomit and eat and vomit and drunk and drunk and drunk and sick. Sensuality, passions. Any pathetic memories coming to mind? Drunkenness, orgies, drinking parties. And then notice the summary term, lawless idolatry. All of this they did in worshiping false gods. It was part of their religion. You're like, oh, that's really weird. I would never do that. Yeah, well, the Western world uh, North American God is uh, you. And uh, we do all these things in worship of ourselves. At least they knew there was a power bigger than themselves, even if they were making it up. Verse 4. This is in the context of suffering. Guard your behavior. With respect to this, they are surprised when you do not join them in the same flood of debauchery. There, the word flood there is the idea of being washed away by sin to a sudden, certain damnation. It's a flood of, of wickedness that, that rushes people into hell. And in regard to these things, they, that's the Gentiles, which means unbelievers, 
Not a Jewish Gentile thing. It's a saved, unsaved thing. They're surprised when you don't join them in the same. We're, we're on the river to hell. Get a raft. <laughs> they are surprised when you do not join them in the same flood of debauchery. And then notice this. And they malign you. The word there in the original means literally they blaspheme you. And not just insults. Some Bible thumper, holy roller, Jesus freak. <laughs> yes, I am. Yes, I am. Yes, I am. Been there, done that. Just shame and regret and heartache and devastation. I so don't want any more of that in my life. Sin overpromises and underdelivers every time, every time. It glitters, but it is not gold. It shouts for my attention, but it doesn't really give me what it promises. Choose to sin. Choose to suffer. I'm not going back there. And worst of all, during a time of real hardship, remember just in a few verses, he's going to tell us here that Satan is your adversary prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. Now, don't you think that Satan sees God's children when they're going through hardship? Don't you think he's waiting for an opportune time to pounce on you and things that haven't tempted you for a long time can crush you during a trial when all of your strength and all of your resources and all of your energy are going into what? Into surviving. We're just trying to get by over here. We're just trying to get by over here. And Satan will come in and, and make a rush on you. And you can find yourself stumbling and falling into thought patterns and action patterns that you thought were gone forever. But they're right there. Well, I didn't think I'd ever touch that bottle again, but here it is. Empty in my hands. And he wants to shame you. And, dro and drop you to your knees and make you feel like you haven't made any progress at all and take you just back to square one again and grind you under his heel. Listen, as a blood-bought son or daughter of the living God, you were born for something much better than that. Amen? <laughs> but you want to know what to do? You want to know what to do during a trial? Guard your behavior. Verse 5 says, they'll give an account to him who's ready to judge the living and the dead. They'll give an account to him who is ready to judge the living and the dead. Well, he doesn't really judge the living. He doesn't judge us till we're dead. So they can't really be talking about spiritual... Oh, okay, okay. Okay, I think it's talking about the spiritually living and the spiritual dead because there's no real distinction between those who are alive spiritually and those who are dead spiritually in this life. So God is ready to judge or call to account both those who have life in Christ and those who are the wages of sin is death. For this is the reason why the gospel was preached to those who are dead. What? What? We don't preach the gospel to dead people, man. Some churches teach that that the gospel is preached to people, that there's a second chance after you die. The Bible doesn't teach that. The Bible teaches Hebrews 9.27, it is appointed unto man once to die, and after this comes judgment. One chance, baby, one chance. Hold up the, how many chances do you get? One. You get one chance. One life, this is it. Yes or no, up or down, broad road, narrow road. Here's what it means. Notice the tenses. For this is why the gospel was preached. Uh, present or past? It was already preached. It was already preached to people who are dead. Dead then or dead now? Dead now. It was preached to them when they're alive, but they're dead now. Do you know who he's talking about? He's talking about certainly Christians who had died, but probably, though we can't read his mind, probably Peter, by God's Spirit, had in mind people who had been martyred for the faith. The gospel had been, was preached to them. They heard it and responded and now they were saved. Think of it that way. This is why the gospel was preached, even to those who are dead. 
that though judged in the flesh, how were they judged in the flesh? Do you know how they were judged in the flesh? People called them forward and said, deny Jesus Christ or die, and they thought they were right. They thought they were doing the right thing. Deny Jesus Christ or die, and they would not, and they died for it. They were judged in the flesh, notice, the way people are. For this is why the gospel was preached even to those who are dead, that though judged in the flesh the way people are, they might live in the spirit the way God does. See, because at the end of the day, what matters most? A human verdict or God's verdict? See, it doesn't matter what your mom says you are. It doesn't matter what your spouse says you are. It doesn't matter what your kids or your coworkers or your crazy sister says you are. All right? All that really matters is what God, I am who God says I am. And even if you had to leave this world early because of some false verdict that was pronounced upon you, what a trial that would be. What an ultimate trial that would be. What an ultimate price that would be. But in the end, God's verdict is the one that will stand. All right? So uh, that's verses 1 through 6. What to do with trials. Guard your behavior. Now this is interesting. Um, Second thing, guard your behavior, starting now in verse 7, grace your relationships. Grace your relationships. The end of all things is at hand. Therefore, be self-controlled and sober-minded for the sake of your prayers. That's kind of a transition verse. He reminds us of the brevity of life. Be self-controlled, be sober-minded, for the sake of your prayers. What does that mean, for the sake of your prayers? Well, because if you're always goofing around all the time and everything's a big joke to you, and I like to laugh. How many people know I like to laugh? I like to laugh, but there better be a seriousness to it. All right? And I believe in my teaching ministry, I believe very strongly that laughter is one of the things that drops our uh, guard a little bit, and we kind of relax, and we lean in, and we listen. But the last thing I am is a comedian. You better know that. I, I, I'm, I'm, look, at, I'm as serious as a heart attack when I'm talking to you about. I couldn't be more serious. I think that's appropriate for a follower of Jesus Christ. And, 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 and uh, not a lot of joking around going on with God, by the way. How many people tell God jokes in their prayer times? <laughs> Lord, I want to get down to business here, but before I do, did you hear the one about the... <laughs> All right. Well, because even the, even the most basic kindergarten Christian knows there's something incongruous about joking around with God, all right? This is life and death. This is heaven and hell. This is God's glory and Satan's kingdom in this world. This is light and darkness. This is serious business. So be self-controlled. Be sober-minded for the sake of your prayers. And then notice this, above all, now, if you hadn't read the rest of the verse, look up here quick. Don't read it. Don't read it. Don't read it. Don't read it. <laughs> That's a big deal. I've been talking up here for a little while. Now, above all, I wonder what you would have thought would be the thing that he would say. In other words, whatever you do when you're in the midst of trials, whatever you do, above all, let's say that together. Say it. Above all. Above all Above all, keep loving one another earnestly. I love that word, earnestly. It's really not a word that can be pronounced without a little bit of... Mm. Okay, ready? Earnestly. So, so, ready? How should we love one another? Earnestly. Oh, come on, a little more throat. Ready? Earnestly. Okay, because you got it. You come here, John. I want to love you earnestly. Come here. All right? I don't, I don't mean, I mean, when you, when you go through some things, come on up here for a second. When, when, you, go th- when you go through some things, listen, listen, okay? And it's true. Like, th- this is like, yeah, I haven't been through much, huh? It's just, hey, nice to see you, all right? But when, when you've been through some things, I mean, the people that you treasure, I mean, you want to you wanna take hold of them, and you want to, you know, you want to love one another earnestly. Yeah. I'm here for you, man. <laughs> okay? You. Amen. Amen. You know what I'm talking about? Thanks, man. I want to put a little weight into this. I want to put some energy into it. And it takes a lot of energy. Love one another earnestly. Why are we doing that again? Since love covers a multitude of sins. 
Love covers. You say, not at my house. We don't cover nothing, man. Everything's out in the open. <laughs> um, yeah, that's not super loving. Okay? Yeah, but, but 1 Corinthians 13, love does not rejoice in iniquity. It rejoices in the truth. I get that. So when I'm turning to the person, I'm straight up with them about it. I'm not playing games. I'm not cutting corners. I'm right on it. But y'all don't need to know about it. I don't necessarily need to let you all in on the sin that's going on at my house or where I work, all right? Because I love this person, I don't want to shame them in front of you. I'm not going to parade their problems up in front, even as I rehearse some of my trials. I'm not going to go into the details of all of these things because I love these people. Do you get it? All right? And that's the way we need to be in our relationships with one another. We don't need to go and pour out a big stream of, do you know what my husband has done now? No, no, I don't want to know. And if you love him, you're going you're gonna to cover that. Now, that doesn't mean, because there's a bit of a danger here, that doesn't mean that you hide sin or that you put yourself at risk, hear me? That doesn't mean, look at, look at, look at, if there's things that are going on that are illegal, skip the co love covers, just call the police. All right? <laughs> do you hear me? Because, you know, up and down these rows, lots of smiles. But somewhere here listening, that was your word right there. All right? If it's illegal, just call the police. And don't hide it under some Christian blanket that isn't even really biblical. The authority structures in society and in the church are meant to protect us when the authority structure in the home is failing. And don't let some false spirituality uh, promote sin in the name of a misplaced idea of love. But... Apart from an illegality, love covers, it protects. And then notice right in the middle of the trial context, show hospitality to one another. Because if you're not sure how to love, have a party. Okay? If you're really not sure how to, well, it's such a big church and I, do, I don't know anybody, well, meet some people. Stand in the lobby and give out cards. You say, well, we're not really sure how to have over. We'll have the wrong people over first. <laughs> Show hospitality uh, to one another without grumbling. <laughs> I love that when God has you in mind. <laughs> Verse 10. As each has received a gift... Every follower of Jesus Christ has been given a gift. I don't believe we get spiritual gifts. I don't think you have gifts. I think you get one gift. Think of it like a pie chart. And I get a, I get a big piece of leadership and a medium-sized piece of administration and, and, and uh, another piece of exhortation in my pie. And then I get a very little piece of mercy, very small <laughs> piece of mercy. You're like, oh, I got a great big piece of mercy. And think of it like a pie chart. You get one gift with several things in it. That's your gift. It's your capacity to serve God. It's your supernatural enablement. As each one received a gift, whatever your gifts are, use it to serve one another, especially during trials. You're like, well, I do want, I do want to bless people. I do, I do want to bless people. But mainly what I want to do is I want to tell them some stuff. Yeah, yeah, watch out for the talker during trials, okay? You know, you see that person coming across the parking lot in the church, you're like, oh, we got to go, okay? And, and uh, am I not right that a lot of times, I mean, it doesn't matter. When you talk to someone who's been through a deep valley, you say, how's it going? How's it really going? Within a matter of moments, one of the things that will come out is, they'll see, see this over here? See this knife here? Let me tell you what they said. It's true. Everybody's got a story of somebody who said something. Ready, aim, fire, bam! Yeah, that's my gift of encouragement again. I just go around. Yeah, no, I don't think that's your gift, man. You say, James, you're making me really afraid. I don't know what I'm going to say. Verse 11 will help. Whoever speaks in trials, whoever speaks as one who speaks the oracles of God, one who speaks the word of God. You will never go wrong sharing scripture with people. 
Avoid things that are judgmental, but, but just share the word of God. Share a scripture that's meant a lot to you. Send a verse in the mail. Send a verse by email. Dear John, praying for you. Reference, verse, love, name. Awesome. F- going to feed the person. Going to bless them. God's gonna Speak for God. God's in charge of the trial. He needs messengers. Speak for God. If anyone speaks, speak the oracles of God. Whoever serves, this is just now, use your gifts. Use your gifts. The grace, God's varied grace at the end of verse 10. If you're a server, serve. If you're a speaker, speak. But whatever you do, do it by the strength that God supplies. Be prayed up. Be filled with the Spirit. If you want to be used to bless someone who's going through a trial, you need to be right with God. And you need to be drawing down upon God's strength. You'll be saying, Lord, I want to be helpful here. Give me wisdom to know how I can help. By the strength that God supplies, excuse me, in order that in everything, God may be glorified. That's going to be coming up in our next point. Through Jesus Christ, to him belong glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. 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 I want to be used by God. I want to be used by God to help other people. I hope that God's using me in this situation. It was interesting. When I told my church that, that Kathy and I were coming out here, the elders had to approve this whole plan, and, 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 and your church had to approve, and has been so gracious to receive us. And, and, of course, you know this teaching is going to be shown at our church, and so we're all kind of together in this. It's really amazing. And... and um, but when I told some of the people in our church that I was doing this, they're like, what, what is wrong with you? Why don't, why, don't you just, why don't you just go out there and just do nothing for these 10 weeks? Why don't you just go out there and do nothing for, and, just, and just go get better? And I know what, what they meant, and, and, I, and they meant well. And I love them for the expression. But I had to tell the whole church, yeah, probably, you know, putting my feet up for that amount of time probably wouldn't be super healthy, you know? Maybe, maybe more healthier in the midst of trials is what's being talked about here. Just whatever your gift is, use it, right? This is my gift, and so I want to use that. That's what's healthy for me is, is to be forced to dig into God's Word myself so that I could be drawing down upon the strength that, that God wants to give me by I'm preaching to myself here. And I'm preaching to all of us. And, and we're learning together about how to go through difficult seasons. So, use your gifts. Summary heading for that part. Grace your relationships. Love one another earnestly. Here's the last thing, starting in uh, verse 11. Really in verse 12 is where I guess I'll jump in. What, what, what do I do? Uh, guard your behavior. Grace your relationships. Here it is. Glorify God. The Westminster Confession says that the chief end of man is to glorify God and to enjoy him forever. Now, amazingly, even though that's our purpose for being here. uh, How old are you? 19. Super. You probably got a few more years to go. All right? (laughs) Now, the reason why you get to be here a little longer is so you can bring glory to God. Make no mistake about that. Whoever you marry should be for God's glory. You married yet? Okay, make sure that's for God's glory, okay? Going to have kids? Okay, good plan. Make sure that's for God's glory. Going to have a job? Pick one where you can glorify God. Going to drive a car? Keep God's glory in mind, okay? That's what the whole thing is about. Glory is what emanates from God, all right? That's what it is. You don't get to see God. You understand that? Nobody ever sees God. Um, no one has seen God. John 1.18 says, the only begotten Son who's in the bosom of the Father, he's declared him. Nobody gets to see God. No one can see my glory and live, God said. Remember Moses in the Old Testament? He wanted to see God, right? And God's like, right, you're going to see me? I'll tell you what. Hide in this rock, and then I'll pass by, and then you can see my swoosh. (laughs) That's what it means. You, You can see my afterburn. Because if you actually see me, you'll be burning. Okay? You can't see God. Do you get it? All right? You don't get to see God. No one can see God and live, the Scripture says. All you see is his glory. You see the manifestation of his presence. You see the evidence that God is around. Now, I live in a very flat area, all right? Though there is a lot of things that are beautiful where I'm from. 
things that you would find very beautiful. Being out here, Kathy and I have remarked daily about the mountains and how beautiful they are. And we're renting a little place up in the Redlands, and um, we've been going for walks out in these hills. I look to the hills from whence come my help, the Bible says. My help comes from the name of the Lord. See, the psalmist looked at the creation, and he thought, God, God, all right? That's the creation shouting the existence of God. God created the universe to glorify himself. But here's the interesting point. The voice of creation will always be muted. The defining moment of creation is mankind. We are here to display the glory of God. Remember what Jesus said? If you are silent, the stones and the rocks will cry out. Right? The message of the existence of God cannot be silenced in the universe. So we are here to manifest God's presence. That's what your whole thing's about from here on in, okay? So don't say nobody had never told you. You probably knew this before you came, but now for sure I won't forget I told you, okay? This is your thing from here going forward. I'm here to display, we called it, display the superiority of the life lived in God. I'm here to do what the mountains do very poorly. My life is to shout the existence of God. Look at her, how she goes through things. Look at her, how she triumphs no matter what. God must be in her. Yes, he is. Okay? That's why we're here. Now, take that into this last paragraph. Beloved, in light of that, do not be surprised at the fiery trial when it comes upon you to test you as though some strange thing were happening to you. But rejoice insofar as you share Christ's sufferings. If you're making notes under glorify God, this will help you do it. Put down rejoice. Four things here to close. Rejoice insofar as you share Christ's sufferings that you may also rejoice and be glad when his glory is revealed. There's the theme, his glory. I want to show God's glory, and if I'm living for God's glory, then when Jesus returns and his glory is ultimately revealed, like that would be the greatest moment ever because I've been trying to like turn up the volume on that, but I mean, when he gets here, it's going to be awesome. The earth will be filled with the glory of the Lord. Right? Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his, his glory. When his glory is revealed, if you are insulted for the name of Christ, you are blessed. If you are insulted for the name of Christ, you are blessed because the spirit of glory and of, there it is, and of God rests upon you. <laughs> but let none of you suffer as a murderer. In other words, oh, we're going through really hard times over here, you know, and, and yeah, God's like, I'm going through a trial. Yeah, no, no, when you killed that guy, yeah, that's not a trial. Okay, you're a murderer. <laughs> oh, I'm going through a trial over here. I, 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 they're putting me in jail because I didn't pay for my gas. No, that's not a trial. You're a thief. See it there? Let none of you suffer as a murderer, a thief, or an evildoer. This is kind of funny. Or a meddler. What's that doing on the list? <laughs> because if that's the source of your problems, you're not going through a trial. Yet if anyone suffers as a Christian, because I love God, because I won't lower the flag, because I won't give up, because I won't stop talking about him, Yet if anyone suffers as a Christian, let him not be ashamed. There's another good thing. Rejoice. Don't be ashamed. But let him glorify God in that name. You can see where I got the theme. You see it? Glorify God. Manifest the reality of God's presence in your life. For it is time for judgment to begin at the house of God. That's another great thing. Rejoice. And, and uh, don't be ashamed and self-examine. Time for judgment to begin at the house of God. Look at your own life. And if it begins with us, what will be the outcome for those who do not obey the gospel of God? In other words, instead of getting up on my self-righteous high horse about non-believers, God's standard's pretty high. How am I doing as one of his children who, who understands what will be the outcome for those who do not obey the gospel of God? And if the righteous is scarcely saved, what will become of the ungodly and the sinner? 
if the righteous is scarcely safe. What, is, what does that mean? Here's what it means. It's only the grace of God that keeps you from falling into hell this moment. The only reason why the sun's going to come up tomorrow morning is grace. It isn't just grace that saves you, okay? It's grace that keeps you, all right? I, I hate this sense like, well, I couldn't save myself, so I came to the cross, but now I'm going to sanctify myself. No, Colossians 2, 6 says, as you receive the Lord, so walk in him. And you, 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 can't, you couldn't take the first step without God, and you can't take any of the other steps without him. You can't be successful in trials without him. You can't do anything right spiritually without him. It's all of grace. Everyone say all of grace. All of grace. That's what it means, scarcely saved. You're just hanging on by the grace of God right here, kept by the power of God, Peter says in his next book. And if the righteous is scarcely saved, what will become the, of the ungodly and the sinner? Therefore, let those of us who suffer according to God's will, there's the last thing, entrust yourself to God. Entrust their souls to a faithful creator while doing good. Just get back to work, boys. Just keep doing in the midst of trials. Don't quit. Don't give up. Don't stop teaching your class. Don't stop leading your home group. Don't stop sharing uh, your faith. Don't stop reading your Bible. Just keep doing the things you've been doing. And let those who suffer according to God's will. Why am I going through what I'm going through? It's God's will. So entrust your souls to a faithful creator. God's faithful. He's in control. He's good. And I'm going to wait until the darkness becomes light. Entrust your soul to a faithful creator and keep doing good. Let's pray. Father, these are good words for us where our minds and hearts are renewed by your word and we receive them. It's all true. As your children in the midst of trials, we need to guard our behavior. God help us, we need to grace our relationships. Most of all, Lord, we, we want to bring glory to you. We want people to see the reality of who you are. It's all that will matter to us a hundred years from today. So give us that focus, not on the past, not on the future. Sufficient for today are the cares of today. And we entrust ourselves to you, faithful creator. Give us strength to keep doing good. If you agree with this prayer that I'm praying in Jesus' name, say amen. 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 I will rise and go.